John Wayne Gacy could have been a poster boy for American values, born and raised in the country's heartland. Instead, he earned infamy as one of the world's most prolific serial killers. Those closest to Gacy never imagined he was capable of such brutality. He was the big brother. We were very, very close. I was his sidekick. I was always following him. When we got the news, we were totally in disbelief. Gacy's victims were all young men between the ages of 14 and 21. When my brother Johnny disappeared, we had no idea what happened. Patty Rich's family was devastated to discover her brother died at Gacy's hands. The lawyers wouldn't let us say anything to these families. We were never able to apologize. It's been more than three decades since the discovery of John Wayne Gacy's victims, but the world is still stunned by his crimes. Karen lived in this modest home with her parents, Edna and John Gacy Sr., and her siblings, Joanne and John Gacy Jr. This is the living room, and this is where we watch TV. It's the family time after dinner. John was funny. He liked to clown around, but he was more of a serious boy than just being out there, being carefree. My uncle's relationship with my grandfather was tough. He wanted him to be a man's man, and my uncle just didn't measure up. He wasn't ever going to be the hunting and, and fishing kind of guy. My uncle liked to cook. He liked to be in the kitchen with my grandmother. He would help my mom when she baked cookies or made bread or anything, and she'd make these press cookies where you decorated them, and he would actually help decorate. When John was about 17, him and my dad had a really big fight, and it had to do over a car which John had saved for and bought. He took off. We did not know where he was. My mom finally got my dad to get an investigator, and they found he was in Vegas. He actually went to work at this mortuary. Uh, now exactly what he did, I don't know, but it had to do with some of the dead bodies. When he came back a year and a half later, he was just totally different, more into himself. Yet once on his own, Gacy seems to excel. John Gacy was a very successful businessman, active in a local Democratic Party, very well liked. Uh, he had July 4th parties at his house, which were a who's who of Cook County politics. My uncle was the life of the party. Um, he loved to have get togethers. Everything was just fun. He started posing as a clown, so he was called to various events. Even with my kids, they all loved when he was posed as a clown. I remember one time I went with him in his full clown makeup and everything and passing out balloons and taking pictures with the kids and having a good time doing some clown tricks and stuff. He would meet important people, Mayor Daly. He even got clearance to be with Rosalind Carter. It was just he felt like the man of the year. Gacy even has a new wife, Carol. Gacy's mother moves out while Carol and her daughters move in. But when his new family is out of town, 29-year-old Gacy picks up a teenage runaway named Tim McCoy at a bus station. I think at that time, it was a just a, a sexual involvement with that young man. And in the morning, they came into a physical tussle, and he ended up stabbing him. And that was the only victim that was stabbed. But in 1972, no one even knows the boy is missing. Over the next year, Karen notices a change in her brother. John and Carol came for Thanksgiving. And they were talking about something that had been on the newscast. And he just made a comment. He said, well, I would just shoot the bastard. And I just looked at him, and I said, you don't mean that. And he said, you don't know me. And I just told him, I said, you know, John, I said, I'm seeing something happening to you that I just don't understand. In January of 1977, another Chicago teenager vanishes, 19-year-old John Zick. My brother John was about two years older than me. There were five of us in our family, five kids. 
Johnny was the middle child. He was a very outgoing person. He loved animals. He used to bring home stray dogs, stray cats. He even brought home a bullfrog one time. And Johnny wanted to be in the film industry, to go to California and, and make movies. He didn't show up to work on Thursday. He didn't show up to work on Friday, and it was payday. When you're a teenager and you live paycheck to paycheck, you don't skip payday. What we know is that John was on a date that night, and he had taken his date home. And somewhere later that evening, he ran into Casey. Casey fits his car with red flashing lights to make it look like an unmarked police cruiser. He would see somebody that he wanted as his prey. He would stop him, turn his red lights on, say, you're out after curfew, get in the car. He might handcuff him before he got in the car. And that's probably what happened to John. Johnny never came back. Computerization of missing people didn't exist at that time. A lot of these missing persons cases went unnoticed. A missing kid in Chicago, it's just a form that gets filled out and filed away. By meeting Patty, somehow she will know how we felt back at that time. My mom never really got to say that she was sorry for what my uncle had done. I'm hoping for my mom that it helps her to heal even more. Patty's going to be here any minute. What are you feeling? A little bit nervous, her reaction. A little anxious. Not sure how, you know, she'll be with my mom. Hi, Patty. Come on in. All right, Patty, this is Karen. Hi. Hi nice Karen. to meet you. This is my daughter, Sherry. Hi, Hi Sherry. Patty. Nice to meet it's you. Nice to meet you. All right, let's have a seat. I have never had the opportunity to talk to any of the families. And I always wanted to say, especially Patty, you and your mom, that I'm so sorry of what John did to your whole family. When my brother disappeared, I was 16 years old. Um, by the time that the body started coming up, that was two years later. I thought with each step of his incarceration and his execution, I always felt that that was going to be closure for everybody. But I found it it doesn't close it. Mm. It doesn't close no. it. it, it the, it's it's a, a wound that will never heal. Mm -hmm. Right. The news was nothing but Gacy, 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 Gacy. They'd break into the shows to tell you some stupid thing. And if they didn't have something to report that day, they made it up. I made it up. My husband didn't even want me to go to the trial because he was afraid of what was going to happen. Because we knew that we were in a city that was kind of turned upside down by all of it because of the the massiveness of what happened, that didn't take away from how I still felt about the families and their loss. It didn't take away one bit. I mean, I feel for you. I was only 13 or 14 when it happened, but um, there's still a lot of shame, and there always will be. The one thing that I hope you leave here with is knowing that under no circumstances did I ever think you, your sister, your children, your mother had anything to do with this. You know, you can control who your friends are. You can't control who your family is. He took something away from me. That's what made me a victim. He took your life away. The shame that you had to have to carry, I, I just can't imagine. You lost a brother, I lost a brother. It wasn't anyone's choice. It's just 
what happened. Even though the murders were over 35 years ago, the pain of all of it will always be there. I think I'll take it to my grave. It's not going to go away. Nothing can bring back Casey's innocent victims. Some remain unidentified to this day, but Karen hopes sharing her sorrow with Patty will help honor their memory and ease the pain for their families. <laughs>